The defense uh, made clear that I needed his permission to, to have, um, so what it says, uh, without my uh, personal authorization, the District of Columbia National Guard is not authorized the following, to be issued weapons, ammunition, bayonets, batons, or ballistic protection equipment such as helmets and body armor. Now, again, to, to be clear, the Secretary of the Army told me to go ahead and issue that equipment. So we never were going to have weapons or ammunition, and we no longer have bayonets. But we do have a ballistic protection equipment, helmets, body armor. And um, so I did have that with each guardsman. Thank you, General. So, uh, but that was unusual, as you mentioned, to have that kind of request. You, you were on the, June, uh, the January 6th phone call at 2.30 that we heard in from our previous hearing, uh, where the uh, chief of Capitol Police was making an urgent uh, appeal uh, for help. Uh, and uh, we heard that the D.C. Metro Police Chief said it was uh, a tepid response. He was shocked by it. What happened on that call? What was your recollection of uh, the call and were the assessment of the two individuals I mentioned? Was that your assessment as well? This is the Debate Me channel. If you're new to the channel, click on the like button and subscribe. If you're looking for a nonpartisan discussion about topics like this, I'd like to welcome you on board. I know the thought process of people on the left and the right can be a lot of times very emotionally guided. So the automatic knee jerk reaction to seeing the response from the police at the Capitol, an event that I had warned my family about months in advance because I could see where things were headed. Looking at that response versus what happened in the summer, the knee jerk reaction is racism, this is how these people are being treated versus that those people are being treated. It's got to be about skin color. But you have to be careful when you're thinking that way, because that same kind of reactionary thinking is the same stuff you see happening on the right. A lot of stuff that they're all getting bent out of shape about. They're not thinking about it. They're just reacting to what's being fed to them by the media they consume. I'm pretty sure that once you hear my position on that later on in the video, you'll understand where I'm coming from and understand the logic. But let's first hear what the general has to say about his thoughts on what was unusual about the process of defending the Capitol versus how things happen in the summertime with Black Lives Matter. Yes, sir. So that, that call came in. It was uh, we actually helped facilitate it. The, um, the deputy mayor from the District of Columbia uh, and Dr. Rodriguez, Chief Conte, uh, Chief Sun later joined the conversation and we dialed in uh, the senior leadership of the U.S. Army. And, and at that time, Chief Conte and Chief Sun passionately pleaded for District of Columbia National Guard to get to the Capitol with all deliberate speed. Um, so the Army senior leaders did not think that it looked good, it would be a good optic. They further stated that it could, for, it could incite the, uh, the crowd. So their best military advice would be to the Secretary of the Army who could not get on the call. So we, we wanted the Secretary of the Army to join the call, but he was not available. We were told that he was with the Secretary of Defense and not available. But the Army senior leadership expressed to Chief Conti, Chief Sun, uh, Dr. Mitchell, the Deputy Mayor, and others on the call that it would not be their best military advice to have uniformed guardsmen on the Capitol. So, so during the call, you're saying that optics was raised uh, on, on, on that call specifically. So I want to go back to the state, the question I started. You said that uh, you were able to get immediate uh, authorization in the summer of 2020 during those uh, protests. Uh, General Walker, was the issue of optics ever brought up by Army leadership when the D.C. National Guard was deployed during the summer of 2020? Was, was that discussed? It was never discussed uh, the week of June. It was never discussed July 4th when we were supporting the city. It was never discussed August 28th when we supported the city. I think that was unusual? I did. Put uh, in context, you in, in, in your opening statements, you mentioned uh, the National Guard troops that were ready to go. You had them back at the armory. How many folks were in the armory ready to go once the order was given, and at what time were they ready to go? 
I, I had them ready to go shortly after the phone call. So uh, I brought, at 1500, I, I directed that the quick reaction force that was based at Andrews Air Force Base leave the base, get to the armory at all deliberate speed. I had a police escort bring them to the armory. They, they returned to the armory in about 20 minutes. So we had them sitting there waiting. And then in, in anticipation of a green light, a goal, uh, we put guardsmen on buses. We brought them inside the armory so nobody would see them them uh, putting on the equipment and getting on the buses. And then we just waited uh, to to get the approval. And that's why we were able to get to the Capitol in about 18 minutes. Were they on the buses ready to go, do you recall? Before 5 o'clock. But at 5 o'clock, I decided, hey, you know, we're, there's got to be an approval coming. So get on the buses, get the equipment on, get on the buses and just wait. And then a few minutes after that, we did get the approval. I, I was on a, a secure video conference when the Army leadership conveyed to me that the Secretary of Defense had authorized uh, the employment of the National Guard at the Capitol. So uh, my timeline has uh, 1708, 508 p.m. Is when, um, is when we wrote down that we had approval. And that was about eight people in the office with me when I got that. How, how many guardsmen were ready? You said right immediately earlier in the afternoon. About, about 155. So you could have sent 155 much, much earlier. What would have been the impact of sending those 155 right around that 2 o'clock time frame? Well, based on my experience with the summer, and I have 19 years, I have 39 years in the National Guard. I was in the Florida Guard, Hurricane Andrew. I've, I've been involved in civil disturbances. So I believe uh, made a difference. We could have helped extend the perimeter and help push back the crowd. All right, so let's go and dig down into it. Let's get to the details here. So as I mentioned before, it's easy to jump and 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 think that this is automatically a race issue. But unfortunately, in life, things are oftentimes a lot more complex than that. We don't really live in a digital world, although in, in some respects we do. But there's a lot of levels and uh, there's nuance and uh, there is uh, complexity. I'll give a quick example. Trump supporters, many people look at them as a monolith. Not the case. The way I see Trump supporters, I see that it actually has one group. There's actually many groups, but I look at it as there are Trump voters, Trump supporters, and Trumpists. Trump voters are people who simply voted for Trump. They could love Trump, don't like Trump, doesn't really matter. Ultimately, they looked at their choices as a voter and they decided that they rather Trump than Biden. So those are the Trump voters, right? Different ranges of attachment to Trump. Then you have the Trump supporters, people who not only voted for Trump, but actually really like Trump, that they think he's really honest or whatever it is, but they're not the cult types, right? These people are the more rational types. I know it's hard to see them as rational, but they're the more rational types compared to the Trumpists. But ultimately, they look at Trump's policies or the impression that he gives them, and they really, really like what he stands for, right? You can judge them however you want, but that's where they stand. They vote for him, and they really like Trump. These guys, you'll see the MAGA flags, all that kind of stuff. The Trumpists. These are the ones that the media loves because it's, it has high entertainment value. So they're really, really uh, hardcore Trump supporters. No matter what Trump does, they're going to be supporting him no matter what. You can't talk to these people. They're not rational at all. Um, pure emotion, pure fear, pure paranoia, pure um, you know conspiracy theories, QAnon, all that kind of stuff. So when we look at this, this event, and we consider, again, the nuance, the levels, right? It's easy to automatically jump on race because you look at a Black Lives Matter protest and you have a strong response. You look at a Trump supporter protest and you have a really, really light response. But if you dive down into the details, you realize there's a lot of factors to consider. One factor, for example, is Although there has been violence at Trump events and Trump rallies and Trump himself has incited violence at his events in general, his events are not known for violence and they are actually overwhelmingly peaceful. 
Now, I know that is something that is said about Black Lives Matter events, and that is true. However, with Black Lives Matter events, there is typically two sides. You can have, I know the right likes to make fun of this, the mostly peaceful, and that is something that liberal media is not really being honest about. They're, they're playing games, but but actually they will have a mostly peaceful event. So that means you could be marching from eight in the morning until 6 p.m. all day, no violence whatsoever. Um, maybe you block a road or some, a roadway or something like that, but it's, you know, Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace, whatever. Just marching peacefully. Everyone's, you know, well, most people are masked up, you know, no big deal. However, typically, and specific, I'm referring to Portland, typically, once it gets dark, especially around midnight, typically you can expect there's going to be riots. There's going to be violence. That's not something that happens once in a while. It's not something that's sort of strange or stands out. That's the typical thing. They're trying to burn down buildings. They're firing rocks at the police. Many police officers uh, were hospitalized. I know there were, were protesters that were also injured as well. But the point is that violence is a common thing that is associated with Black Lives Matter. We can't just look at the peaceful marching and ignore the repeated riots that, I mean, think, you're having riots on a nightly basis, right? Um, at a Trump event, you would have, you know, some guy punch someone or, or, or a fight broke out here, but the idea of a bunch of Trump supporters trying to burn down a building or going and, and doing some mass violent uh, uh, thing, that is not what you normally see at the rallies, right? Um, so with that being said, you have to factor that in in terms of uh, ignorance, because even though I mean, I monitor these events, I, I track this stuff. I talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, I've watched, you know, what happens on the ground live to actually see what's really going on. So I know what really goes on at these events. And even I, the one who is here saying that they are actually usually the peaceful ones right now, let's not talk about right wing extremists. That's a whole nother um, bag of apples. Um, they definitely when they strike its body bags right but i'm specifically talking about trump rallies not right-wing extremists even though right-wing extremists might actually go to the rallies but in terms of the rallies themselves that's not something where we would typically see violence but even me saying that i warned my family months ahead of time that the certification dates the state certification dates and then finally the one at the capitol would be a high probability of violence right so think about that on one hand, I'm telling you that this group is not normally violent. On the other hand, I'm telling you I was so confident that they would be violent on this particular day that I warned my family. I mean, I didn't want to tell my, my father. He's elderly. I don't want to have him be scared or whatever, but I felt it necessary to protect my family, to alert them that there was a high probability of an attack on that particular day. Just because I've been monitoring what's been happening, I've been seeing all of the uh, the lies from Trump and the election stuff and all that. And I could see that a lot of people really thought he was gonna flip the election. So obviously when you rip off that Band-Aid, right? And I saw the level of anger and fear and whatever, and all that being bottled up and, and, and they're being teased by, you know, Steven Crowder and Tim Poole, all these guys leading them on, you know, Trump can win, Trump can win, Trump can win. You don't play with people like that, right? On one hand, I consider ignorance. Our government is very broken and there's a lot of incompetence in our government. In addition to that, there's corruption. Okay, um, and do you remember who was mostly talking about the optics, the questions that Senator Peters asked you and they're concerned about that? Yes, yeah, so during the phone call with, uh, with the District of Columbia National, the District of Columbia uh, leaders, the Deputy Mayor, Chief Son, Dr. Rodriguez, who was talking about optics were General Flynn and General Pyatt. And, and they both said it wouldn't be in their best military advice to advise the Secretary of the Army to have uniformed guards members at the Capitol during the election confirmation. So, so I think just jumping to the conclusion that it's purely based on race, I think is um, not wise, shall we say. But anyway, that's my take on that. This is a Debate Me channel. Debate me in the comment section below. Click on the like button, subscribe, smash that bell.